So as long as I, I can remember, this, uh, this time of year, this Advent season, has is, is been a season that is jam-packed, uh, full of emotion. And Advent and the days leading up to Christmas, as long as I can remember, have been days that have been full of a sense of excitement and anticipation and gratitude and joy. It's fun watching children and watching children of all ages uh, get filled with a sense of anticipation for Christmas itself. Yet I have to say, and I'm sure this is true for some of you as well, that there's part of me during this time of year that feels some sadness. Uh, sadness not over being with some people that I really love. Sadness and profoundly missing those who no longer uh, walk this earth. The season, said another way, is a nostalgic season. And I often feel quite sentimental during Advent. I think a lot about the days of my childhood, the days that seemed so much simpler than they do now and far less complex. And it is perhaps because the season feels so nostalgic that images of my childhood have been popping into my mind, including images of, of some old television shows that I used to like as a kid. And I was thinking about some of these old shows and and shows like Sesame Street, Leave It to Beaver, My Three Sons, remember that one? The Andy Griffith Show, which I'm pleased to say our kids now like to watch. Uh, remember Captain Kangaroo and his red jacket? And then there's the classic Mr. Rogers, who I miss, and the world lost him not too long ago. And as some of you know, Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister. And I was actually blessed one day to have the opportunity to talk to him for about half an hour on the phone about a mutual friend. He had a very good friend who was a friend of mine. I was trying to pull off a surprise that included Mr. Rogers. And when I listened to him speak, he sounded exactly like he did on the television set. <laughs> it's a wonderful day in the neighborhood, isn't it, Robert? <laughs> and when I talked to him, I, I was filled with a sense of tremendous peace and calm, just like I felt when I used to watch him as a kid. Well, while he may not have been known for his ability to sing, <laughs> certainly what he sang was poignant for many. And I think in a lot of ways, Mr. Rogers had a prophetic voice. Here's one song that you may remember the lyrics of. There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you, many, many ways. The singing way to say I love you. The cleaning up room can say I love you. Hanging up a coat before you're asked to kind of love you. Drawing pictures. You'll find so many ways to say I love you. What a, what a great song. Deeply, deeply Christian. Deeply, I mean, it's just about the gospel itself. Back to Mr. Rogers a little bit later. Our gospel reading today is from chapter 3 of Matthew. It's a, it's a well-known reading. It's a fiery reading. I've, I've always loved it. It's about another man with a very prophetic voice, John the Baptist. And I have to imagine that while we may sentimentalize John the Baptist, I have a feeling he was not a character that was easy to be around. And I have a feeling that most of the people around the John the Baptist in his day would have reacted to him like being in a back alley in New York City and running into a big homeless guy. Well, John the Baptist, we know, was the son of a priest, a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And recall that Elizabeth and Mary were relatives, Mary the mother of Jesus. And remember that Mary visited Elizabeth and that when Mary gets there, the baby within Elizabeth, John the Baptist, leaps in her womb because John knows all about Jesus before he's born. And when John grew up, he had a ministry in which he told people his calling in life was to tell people about the coming of the Messiah, anointed one, anointed one because kings in those days were anointed with oil. Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. And John's announcement would have been something that the people thought about or kind of knew about in the back of their mind because they would have known, at least religious people would have been very familiar with the words of Isaiah when he even talked about the man who would come, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. And some people would have thought, well, this is the guy that Isaiah was talking about. And John preached, people, if God's on his way, you need to get ready. You need to get ready. You need to clean yourselves up. He said, and to be cleansed, John the Baptist 
took people into the River Jordan and would wash them as a symbol of cleansing, of cleansing of all of their sin and their tendency to sin and their tendency to want to do things their own way instead of God's. And John, though, also preached a message of repentance. As one person writes, John begged people to change their lives in preparation for the event to beat all events. The Son of God was about to come. People would get to meet God face to face, and that required some getting ready. And John was screaming about waking up from sleepwalking through life, screaming about confusing our ways with God's ways, screaming about accumulating sins like we accumulate things. Repent. What an interesting word. When many of us hear the word repent, we probably have a reaction to it. It's a word that is often misunderstood. Some people feel uncomfortable. Some people use the word as a tool of hatred and loathing. And sadly, sometimes people of faith think that repent is only something for those kinds of Christians to think about, those kinds of Bible Christians, whatever. The bottom line is, repent is not a, a neutral word for anybody who has heard it before. But I want to take a look at the word repent and what it means with you this morning. It's a word that's all over Scripture. Uh, at least 49 times in the New Testament it shows up. It shows up all over the Old Testament. And um, just some examples from the Old Testament. Isaiah one day said to the people of Israel, Repent, return my people to God. And God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah saying, If the people will repent, I will start over with them. And then remember the story of Jonah and the people of Nineveh. And it reads in the book of Jonah that the people of Nineveh listened, listened and trusted to God and they repented. And all of the examples in the Old Testament in our reading today basically speak of repentance. And repentance, the word, literally means to change your mind. It means to change your mind. And the results of changing your mind means your behavior changes. So repentance means a change of mind and a change of action. And repentance is fundamentally about making a decision, about making a choice. It's a decision. It's going through life not mindlessly, but it's going through life thinking about what is it that I want in my life and do, is what I want in my life based on what God wants for my life. That's repentance. It's a decision to stop being our own God. It's a decision that involves deciding that life without God just isn't going to work. Repentance is, again, about change in mind, change in behavior. It's about becoming a, a different person, to think differently, to act differently, to live differently. It's about transformation. And while John the Baptist used this word repent, he meant something else. Because if you look at the Gospel of Matthew, when, she, when John used the word repent, he was using the present tense. In other words, Keep on repenting. Not just repent once and everything's fine, but keep on repenting. Be a person of continual repentance, of continually changing your mind and turning back to God. Now, repentance is important for us to talk about because it's important to do, but it's important to talk about because repentance is often so misunderstood. Now, in our reading today, John says, you know, repent, you brood of vipers. He's talking to religious, religiously self-righteous people, people who think they have it all down and are perfect. And he's reminding them that they need to repent of that. They need to turn away from that. But that's not all that John was saying that day because there were more people around him than just the religiously self-righteous. You see, a lot of people, when we hear the word repent, we can feel Guilty, inadequate, rotten, bad, or even defensive. But it's important to remember that feeling guilty, inadequate, rotten, bad, or even defensive is not the ultimate purpose of repentance. The heart of our Christian faith is love, not punishment. And if the idea of repentance leaves a person feeling punished, they've missed the whole point. Over the years, I've encountered so many people who have come to be burdened by a faith that says, you're not good enough. Shape up or else. It's all about guilt. I've run into so many people who have felt that way. 
I've known people who run around in their life when they encounter faith feeling tied up in knots with a deep sense of worthlessness. It's sad because that's not the point. It's important to remember that repentance is also about challenging those nagging voices in our head that tell us that we're not pretty enough, rich enough, powerful enough, or smart enough. Most people need to repent and turn away from those kinds of feelings. Repentance is about accepting the fact that we are totally loved and forgiven in God's eyes, and it's about building a new identity, a new life, a new relationship with others based on that identity. Repentance is not about being burdened. It's about being liberated. It's about being freed from all that weighs us down and makes us feel rotten about ourselves. It's an invitation to turn life, decisions, problems, and relationships and everything we have over to God. Repentance, as I look at, look at it, is God's invitation to come clean with God. Isn't it great when you have a relationship that you can come clean with the person? And that's what God wants. God wants for us to come clean with God with all of our mistakes, all of our misdeeds, all of our faux pas. Not so that we feel burdened and rotten, but so that we feel liberated from it. And when we come clean with God, turn back to God, God, if we pay attention, will realize is not holding up a rod to beat us up, but is rather offering us forgiveness and a new journey and love. But something hit me this last week as I was thinking about this whole thing. And that is that repentance, I believe, is also it's about everything I've talked about, but it's also about getting in touch with something else. And this something else may sound trite to you, but it's not. I think it's actually quite powerful because it's not something I think a lot of people think about. And what I want to say to you is not rhetorical pablum. <laughs> it's not simplistic. It's actually quite potentially life-changing if you think about it. And that is to remember that God not only loves you, but God likes you. There's a difference. Repentance is ultimately about turning back to our God who likes you. Remember, God made you. Of course he likes you. Well, earlier I spoke about Mr. Rogers and the impact he had on so many people. And perhaps his show, which was as powerful as it was because it was his ministry, but maybe his show was as powerful as it was because he understood something fundamental. He understood that God not only likes you, but that God loves you. And Mr. Rogers had a song about it. And the lyrics went something like this. Now listen to these lyrics, which I believe represent the voice of God. And I think that Fred Rogers was brilliant in expressing them. And listen to him a second. It's, it's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. It's you. The way you are down deep inside. It's not all the things that hide you. Think of that phrase. It's not the things that hide you. It's not your toys. They're just beside you. It's you I like, your skin, your eyes, your feelings. Whether old or new, I hope you will remember even when you were feeling blue. That it's you I like, it's you. It's my prayer that during this Advent season, that all of us are going to take some time to come clean with God. You may not be in a place that you can do it with somebody you know intimately. It may be too complicated. But take the time to come clean with God. Lay it all out before God. Get out what is deep within you and share it with God. Be totally honest with God about what's happening down deep inside. Again, it may be too hard to do with a person, but do it with God. It's my prayer that we're going to turn to God in this way and it's my prayer that when you do this, when you repent in this way, which is what that is, is you're going to discover that God not only loves you and forgives you, but that God actually likes you. 
not on the outside, but down deep. He made you. He made you who to be you really are. And he made us to be his, no ifs, ands, or buts. Adam. Take that message seriously. God loves you, but God likes you down deep inside. Amen. And let's now turn to our prayers.